Hi. Uh, my name is Arnaldo Mello. Uh, I'm a senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, and I, uh, I'm Brazilian. I work from home uh, in the Brazilian Northeast. Uh, you can see a photo of my backyard. So I've been working with the Linux kernel since 1998, a long time ago. Uh, during this time, lots uh, changed in this uh, community. Uh, people came and people went and uh, the number of developers grew and uh, that the places where Linux is being employed uh, as well. Uh, I started working with, with networking and uh, doing changes to the TCP IP stack uh, to make it use less resources and scale better. And nowadays, I, I maintain the Linux observability tools, which is something that I will talk a little bit more in this presentation. Uh, as it is a way for you to learn uh, how the various projects work by inspecting its internals. The interesting part that I've learned all those years uh, while working with others is that you interact with people from lots of places and uh, the the way that they think and how they expect things to, to work uh, is different across lots of places. We have uh, to try and, oh, uh, and uh, observe how other people interact uh, when working in these communities, uh, see how they interact and uh, see how they submit patches, see how the reaction happens and uh, how they react to that and uh, learn from, from reading those conversations. It's the, one of the great aspects of open source that uh, everything is discussed in public. So newcomers can come and, and see how features were implemented, what was the interaction of the developers. And from there, I learn a lot from the process. Where to start? Uh, well, you can you you can be uh, working for some company, and uh, then somebody will tell you where to start. But uh, if you are interested in getting to a open source community, uh, the best advice I, I can give is try to find something. Uh, on your computer or in your cell phone, a smartphone that you don't like, that you would like to to work in some other way, something which is not working. So you you after that you you, can, you, you should try to locate the source code and um, in the usual places, Google, uh, GitHub. Uh, and uh, then you can look at the source code, and uh, if you are, uh, if you know about that specific language that is used to implement the that project, then you you can already start to find uh, where that thing that you want to fix is implemented. Uh, another advice is to use observability tools. Uh, it's profilers, tracers, uh, debuggers, so that you can uh, see uh, what are the, the main uh, functions and what are the main sequences of events that lead to that function. And just by looking at it, and especially looking at it when uh, what you think is broken is happening, may help you in pinpointing or where to 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 try to to work on your know, fix uh, and when doing that uh, you may 
find problems, uh, all the problems, uh, as no code uh, is free of bugs. So consider uh, trying to fix things as you learn about the project. That will bring a good a, a goodwill from from the maintainers, from the developers involved in the project. Uh, to, for when you decide to submit your new feature or the fix you started uh, this process with. Uh, how to submit your work? Uh, projects have documented processes. Uh, you you should look at the source code for them, and then you're gonna find how to submit, uh, where to send your patches, uh, to whom, uh, who should be uh, on a CC list. Uh, and uh, most projects by now have also a code of conduct that you should read and see how what's appropriate uh, and how to deal with the other developers. And please try doing it in baby steps. Uh, the smaller, the patch you send, the better. I mean, if, if there are multiple things to do to get to your fix or to your new feature, you should just try to write as small as possible patches that go on building and eventually get to your objective. Because this is easy uh, review by the, the maintainers and by the other developers. Uh, you just have to look at the patch, which is small, and then you see, oh, this is this is okay. Let me go to the next one, and it helps finding problems later uh, using a process that's called bisection, where you utilize uh, tools to uh, do a binary search. Like you you know that the first version works, and now it doesn't work. So you go to the middle in terms of change sets, in terms of patches, and try there. And then you go on saying that this works, it doesn't work, and you get more quickly to what was the change where this problem was introduced. But what if people didn't like my patch? Uh, well, uh, you should read a response, try to clarify things. Perhaps uh, you were you were, was not clear uh, when you first submitted a patch, and then with some clarification, it may become acceptable. Uh, you, you should have problems. Sometimes uh, you you made a mistake or didn't consider some specific case, or, so you should read the, the, the problems that were reported and uh, address them. And then you should resubmit. Uh, it's, you know, resubmit Usually, you send a new uh, patch set, a series of messages, and then you, on the cover letter, on the first message, you you say that's the second version, and you, on the cover letter, you you describe what you, what were the changes that you made in relation to the first version that you submitted. It's all about making progress. Uh, sometimes the maintainer will not. Uh, process all the patches, accept all the patches that you sent, but then it can uh, apply some of them, uh, cherry picking, uh, so to say. Uh, uh, some more recommendations. Uh, you should uh, discuss publicly. Uh, it's, not, it's not interesting to, to send messages in, uh, in, in private mode, like just to one person. Sometimes uh, the developer doesn't have time and that at that moment, and then somebody else on the mailing list may uh, jump in and uh, help you. And sometimes even have more information about that than the person you thought at first should be the, the one that would help you. Be patient. As I said, you, uh, sometimes people are busy with other stuff and then can't re reply as fast as you would like. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, just try to formulate the, the, the questions in as clearly as you can. And uh, this is an interesting process because sometimes uh, all the people who are reading the conversation learn by uh, seeing the answers to your questions 
uh, and also consider participating in conferences uh, with the pandemic uh, most of the, the of the conferences like this one is being uh, done over the internet uh, and uh, the good thing is that the previous uh, uh, conferences have are, are available on, on YouTube and places like YouTube. So please consider as well uh, looking for previous recording for things that you that you have interest in. So with this, I pass to to Kate. Hi, my name is Kate Karsha. I'm an associate manager at Red Hat on the core kernel engineering team. I myself am new to open source, but my team is very active in the upstream Linux kernel community. So although I'm not making direct code contributions, I learned a lot about open source by supporting a mix of engineers, some of whom are very experienced reviewers or maintainers like Arnaldo, as well as engineers who are new to the space and wanna get more involved, more like myself. And as a manager of a team that is working in open source communities, and as a woman in tech who is passionate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm always thinking about how can I help to make open source a more accessible place for everyone? A 2017 GitHub study found that 3% of developers in open source communities identify as female. 1% identify as non-binary, and the study didn't look at race or other diversity groups. There's a lot of work that we have to do here. And so today I'm here to share with you, whether you be a manager or an aspiring manager, or maybe an individual contributor that would like a window into the world of management, how you can help uh, at, through some strategies such as hiring, mentorships and work assignments that helps to make open source a more open place for everybody. The first strategy that I want to cover is about hiring for potential. So let's think about what potential means. Potential means having the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. So Hiring for potential means that we're hiring people for their capacity to develop the, the skills that they need to grow successfully in the role, rather than hiring for the experience that they may have in doing the work that's required by the role. By hiring for potential, we widen the pool of candidates that we consider for open positions. And this enables us to add new capabilities to our teams and in turn, add new capabilities to the open source communities that our teams work in. Now you may be thinking, well, how, how could you hire somebody if you don't at all consider their experience? Hiring for potential doesn't mean that we don't consider someone's experience. It's just that rather than evaluating if they have experience of already doing the job or work required by the job, we're evaluating that their experience is indicative that they'd be able to come in and learn and develop the skills that they need to do the job. So one example of this is hiring for a specific programming language experience. In kernel development, we use C. So in our case, if we were hiring for potential, one way we could do that is instead of only looking at candidates that know the C programming language, we can instead consider candidates also that have an understanding of low level programming concepts, such as control flow or data structures, or maybe comparable languages such as C++ or Rust. And this enables us to, to open ourselves up to the possibility of bringing somebody onto the team who may have a different perspective or may have something unique to bring to the table. So in summary, hiring for potential enables us to, to bring more perspectives onto our teams and into the open source communities that our teams work in. It's about opening opportunities for people that may not have had that chance otherwise, or may not have even known that, there, that that was an option to them. 
Now we'll say, um, of course, just because you plant a seed doesn't mean the plant will grow. And so we have to give that plant water and we have to give that plant sunlight. So in this case, we have when we bring somebody on and we hire them for potential, that alone is not enough. We also have to come in and help them successfully realize that potential. And that's a good segue into the next two strategies that I'll discuss. Mentorships. So something that's really important as a manager is supporting mentorships. And mentoring is a voluntary, ongoing relationship, typically between a more senior associate, the mentor, and a more junior associate looking for development opportunities, which is the mentee. And in these partnerships, the mentor will give advice and guidance and support to the mentee. And in turn, the mentee is able to learn things that they may not have otherwise had the chance to come across if they were just working on their own. Now, mentoring is really important for newcomers, but mentoring is especially important for underrepresented groups in technology. So research actually shows that one factor, uh, one success factor for minorities in corporate America is having a strong support network and mentoring. Uh, but even more so, this research went on to find that a truly effective mentoring is not just about not just about having technical guidance or given, being given direction. It's really about having a quality relationship with trust, where the mentee feels safe to express fears and concern to the mentor. And so as managers, we actually play a very big role in terms of helping to cultivate these types of relationships and to support them. And so I'm going to give some tips that, um, that I that I sort of follow in terms of working with folks that are seeking to be mentees and then also folks that are going to be mentoring. So for newcomers that are looking for a mentor, one of the things that I encourage them to think about is finding someone that they feel like they can be vulnerable with. So going back to what Arnaldo had spoke about earlier and his idea of learning by trying, well, of course, if you're going to be trying something, uh, one of the best ways that you kind of figure out what works and what doesn't is to make mistakes. And so working with somebody as a mentor who you can feel comfortable with to make mistakes, that really gives you the space as a mentee to learn. So I really encourage folks that are seeking mentors to seek out people that they feel that they can be vulnerable with. For more experienced engineers that are mentors, uh, one of the things that I encourage is that they lean into the importance of the role. Now, of course, it is an opportunity for them to solidify their own skill set uh, because they have to have a very deep understanding to be able to explain these concepts. But also, it is an opportunity for them to leverage their experience and their expertise to help forge pathways for new people to join open source communities. And then for both the mentor and the mentee, something I work with is making sure that, that folks have the amount of time that they need to really dedicate to these types of relationships. It is an investment of time on both sides. And so uh, something that makes it successful from my perspective is making sure that people have the time to really invest into it. Moving on to the next strategy is thinking about helping newcomers to identify work that is going to help build their skills, but then also build their confidence. And this is actually something that I do in close collaboration with, uh, with mentors. So a couple of tips that I have regarding this is, one, for somebody who's just getting started, I tend to recommend not picking up work that's going to be in the critical path or is urgent or has a, has a tough timeline. And the reason for that is because I like to give people the chance to really dig into concepts and build a strong foundation of understanding. And if there's a timeline or if there's stress attached to something, I feel that can kind of detract from that experience. So that's one idea. The next idea I have about 
making sure that you know, we can help newcomers identify work assignments is that we want to find work assignments that can be broken down into digestible chunks of work. And the idea behind this is really helping people to, to break down work such that they can get feedback as they do it. And that feedback includes positive feedback, positive feedback being that they accomplish something. Regression is actually quite motivating um, as well. But I find that this is especially important in the case that you're working with new college grads. So research actually shows that one of the biggest struggles that new college graduates have in adjusting to the industry is the fact that there's not a lot of feedback. You know, in college, you take courses, you have a syllabus. Um, that syllabus has deadlines and assignments, and there's rubrics that those assignments are then evaluated against. In the industry and in open source, we have so much freedom. We have freedom to define what we do, how we do it, what success means. And that freedom is, is wonderful, right? We want to harness that freedom. But helping newcomers through that transition period where they're able to learn how to manage that is really important. And so having a mentor that is able to identify a project and help the mentee kind of break that down is certainly something that can, can ease sort of the challenge and, and maybe missing some of that structure. And also it gives the mentee or the newcomer an idea of how to break down work. So in the future, if they independently pick up more ambiguous tasks, then they're able to do something similar on their own. So one thing that I recommend in this particular instance is that for all of project work, it's, it's good to think about, you know, what is your definition of done? But definition of done doesn't always have to be a piece of code. You know, you may break down a project and maybe perhaps some of it is investigation. And as part of that investigation, your definition of done is having some documentation uh, that explains, you know, what your findings were. So going back a little bit to what Arnaldo said again, his approach about, you know, progressing, taking baby steps, rinse, repeat, and grow. I think that this sort of strategy of breaking work down is feeds really nicely into that. But then also, I think that is a is a great strategy to use as a manager as well. You know, everybody, everybody you work with is different. You know, coming back to the plant metaphor, certain plants need more or less sunlight or water to grow. You know, and if it's very sunny, you might need more white water and vice versa. And I'm trying to say is that we have to be adaptable as managers to what people need and how people learn best. And that might look different for everybody. So if a project isn't working, we can change it. And if the connection with the mentor is not there, we can change it. So in summary, managers too can help make open source a more open place by creating more opportunities for people to join open source communities, by helping to support mentorships that provide learning experiences in a support network, and by helping to identify meaningful work that helps to build confidence and skills. So closing out our presentation today, we come back to the heart of what we discussed. Open. Open means having no enclosing or confined barrier accessible on all or nearly all sides. We believe that open source is healthiest when different ideas and perspectives are included, welcome, recognized, heard, respected. We believe that open source is healthiest when it's truly open. And so hopefully you are leaving this presentation with some ideas, whether you be an individual contributor or a manager, and how you can also help unlock all that open has to offer. Thanks for joining us today.
So thanks everybody for coming today. I know we're running probably a little over schedule since we had some technical difficulties, yeah. but we really appreciate all the good conversation and, and thoughts. Thank you.